Happy, happy new year to you. Let's say that to one another. Happy new year. Happy new year. I'm so grateful to start this year with you uh, here. It's, it's been great. We had a, an awesome service at 9 o'clock. It was good to see a large group. I never know if you're going to show up on a holiday like today. And uh, I'm just... How many of you went to sleep before midnight, by the way? It's okay. I think you get to a certain point where that's permissible. So... <laughs> I think that's why we're here. I'm grateful that you're here. As we enter into the new year today, um, we're going to do it in a little bit of a a different way than we've done in years past. Um, We are calling this service a little bit of a Wesley Covenant Renewal Service. And in the tradition of the Methodists of the 1700s and 1800s and even the early 20th century, Methodists would always have church on New Year's Day. And under the leadership of John and Charles Wesley, they would renew their commitment to God and their commitment to the community. And they would always start, didn't matter what day of the week New Year's Day was on, they would always start with worship in the morning, singing hymns and reading scripture and having a a liturgy of covenant renewal. So in this service, you will see in a little bit, we're going to have a liturgy of covenant renewal. And the the text we're going to use is a traditional, you may feel that the language might be a little dated, but this is the traditional Methodist liturgy of renewing our covenant. So as we go into a new year, we don't know what's going to happen this year, but what we do know is that it's in God's hands. So today, we're going to turn over our will for this year into God's hands, and I'm grateful I get to do it with you. Um, I commend all of our announcements into your care. You can check them all out on pages 12 and 13, ways that you can serve in this community and beyond. But let us not waste any time in recommitting our hearts to one another and to the service of God. I invite you to stand as you're able and join in our call to worship. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Today we celebrate the gift of a new year filled with hope and possibility. God, we give ourselves to you on this first day of a new year. Renew within us a commitment to grow in our love for you and our willingness to love our neighbors as you have commanded. Revive our spirits, heal our brokenness, and use us to build your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Let's join in singing our traditional hymn, number 254, We Three Kings. And we're going to be joined by Magi today. And our instructions for singing are all three. We sing on verses 1 and 5, 
and not the rest.
Please be seated. page six for our covenant renewal. And for folks who are online with us, we're grateful for you. If you go to the website haddonfieldumc.org slash now, our church website slash now, you can find the bulletin and we'll be joining on page six for this. The covenant, again, comes from the tradition of early Methodists of recommitting ourselves to God's service. And this is uh, an old liturgy um, but we are unified with our predecessors in this tradition. So join our hearts together. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are more easy and honorable, and others are more dis difficult and disgraceful. Some are suitable to our inclinations and interests. Others are contrary to both. In some, we may please Christ and please ourselves, but then there are other works where we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is necessary, therefore, that we consider what it means to be a servant of Christ. Therefore, let us go to Christ and pray. Let, let me, me be your, your servant, servant under your command. command. I, I will no longer be my own. own. I will give up myself to your, to your will, will in all things. Be satisfied that Christ shall give you your place and work. Lord, make me what you will. I put myself fully into your hands. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed for you or laid aside for you. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and with a willing heart give it all to your pleasure and disposal. Christ will be the savior of none but his servants. He is the source of all salvation. To those who obey, Christ will have no servants except by consent. Christ will accept anything. Christ will not accept anything except full consent to all that he requires. 
Christ will be all in all, or he will be nothing. Confirm this by a holy covenant. To make this covenant a reality in your life, listen to these admonitions. First, set apart some time more than once to be spent alone before the Lord in seeking earnestly God's special assistance and gracious acceptance of you, in carefully thinking through all the conditions of the covenant and searching your hearts whether you have already freely given your life to Christ. Consider what your sins are. Consider the laws of Christ, how holy, strict, and spiritual they are, and whether you, after having carefully considered them, are willing to choose them all. Be sure you are clear in these matters. See that you do not lie to God. Second, be serious and in a spirit of holy awe and reverence. Third, claim God's covenant. Rely upon God's promise of giving grace and strength so that you can keep your promise. Trust not your own strength and power. Fourth, resolve to be faithful. You have given to the Lord your hearts. You have opened your mouths to the Lord and you have dedicated yourself to God with God's power. Never go back. And last, be then prepared to renew your covenant with the Lord. Fall down on your knees, lift your hands toward heaven, open your hearts to the Lord as we pray. I invite you to continue to join your hearts and voices into our covenant prayer provided. And I invite you to take a pause of your prayer posture in whatever forms. You can put your ha hands onto your heart or you can open your ha hands, whatever com is comfortable for you. Let us go to God together uh, and give our heart and prayer. O righteous God, for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, see me as I fall down before you. Forgive my unfaithfulness in not having done your will, for you have promised mercy to me if I turn to you with my whole heart. God requires that you shall put away all your idols. I hear from the bottom of my heart, renounce them all, covenanting with you that no known sin shall be allowed in my life. Against your will, I have turned my love toward the world. In your power, I will watch all temptations that will lead me away from you. For my own righteousness is riddled with sin, unable to stand before you. Through Christ, God has offered to be your God again, if you would let him. Before all heaven and earth, I here acknowledge you as my Lord and God. I take you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, for my portion and vow to give up myself, body and soul as your servant to serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of my life. God has given the Lord Jesus Christ as the only way and means of coming to God. Jesus, I do here on bended knees accept Christ as the only new and living way and sincerely join myself in a covenant with him. O oh, blessed Jesus, I come to you, hungry, sinful, miserable, blind, and naked, unworthy even to wash the feet of your servant. I do here with all my power accept you as my Lord and head. I renounce my own worthiness and vow that you are the Lord my righteousness. I renounce my own wisdom and take you for my only guide. I renounce my own will and take your will as my law. Christ has told you that you must suffer with him. I do here covenant with you, O Christ, to take my lot with you as it may fall. Through your grace, I promise that neither life nor death shall part me from you. God has given holy laws as the rule of your life. I do here willingly put my neck under your yoke to carry your burden. All your laws are holy, just, and good. I therefore take them as a rule of my words, thoughts, and actions, 
promising that I will strive to order my whole life according to your direction and not allow myself to neglect anything I know to be my duty. The Almighty God searches and knows your heart. O oh God, you know that I make this covenant with you today without guile or reservation. If any falsehood should be in it, guide me and help me to set it all right. And now glory be to you, O oh God the Father, whom I from this day forward shall look upon as my God and Father. Glory be to you, O oh God the Son, who have loved me and washed me from my sins in your own blood, and now is my Savior and Redeemer. Glory to you, O God, the Holy Spirit, who by your almighty power have turned my heart from sin to God. Almighty God, the Lord Omnipotent, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you have now become my covenant friend, and I, through your infinite grace, have become your covenant servant. So be it, and let the covenant I have made on earth be ratified in heaven. Amen. Let us take a moment of silence to go deeper into this covenant. Give thanks to God for all the year in 2022 and lift up your dreams and hope for the new year. O oh God of new creation, we are so grateful for the mark of this day as the new year of 2023. We are so grateful for everything in last year, both joyful or challenging moment, because we know you were with us at every second. In the moment of pain and sorrow, you wept with us. And you were merciful with us by releasing the grace of healing and recovery and comfort. Even though we couldn't see you, we have experienced your presence in and among us. So we say thank you for everything. You are Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and the end. We cannot fully understand the concept of time, but we are grateful for the end of the year and the new beginning of the year so that we can have a chance to mark the new season in our life journey. On this New Year's Day, we lift up our hopes and dreams and plans before you. We lift up our worries, fears, and concerns before you. We pray for your will be done on earth, not our own, and fully surrender to you as we just prayed for you before. Help us let go of our grudges, anger, and pains. Let your spirit heal us, bind us, and make reconciliation possible. Help us experience your healing. Give us strength, vision, transformation, and support in our own life, in our community, and the world. We don't know what lies ahead of us, but we are not afraid because you walk beside us as we question and welcome, as we challenge and invite, as we discover and understand, as we see, touch, taste, smell, and listen to you in our daily lives. Oh God, renew our sense of hope each and every day. Renew our sense of motivation each and every moment. Renew our love for you and others with each other, every decision when we make. Have mercy on your children who need your healing grace as they face the limitations and sufferings of their body, mind, and spirit from various health concerns. Have mercy on your children who need peace and comfort as they grieve from their loss. 
Have mercy on your children who need wisdom and direction as they discern their new chapters of life. O oh God of a way maker and a miracle worker, surprise us with your love as we continue our journey together in this new year. We pray all these, our spoken and unspoken prayers of heart, in the name of Jesus, as we renew our covenant with you. And let us continue to pray with the word that Jesus taught us how to pray with the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Happy New Year. Our, to, our scripture reading for today comes from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 23, verses 1 through 3, and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Then King Josiah directed that all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, and all the people, both small and great. He read in their hearing all the words of the Book of the Covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping the commandments, the decrees, and the statutes with all his heart, and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in the book. All the people joined in the covenant. And from Matthew, in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who is the shepherd to all my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I too may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gold frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left their own country by another road. This is the word of God for the people of God.
Thank you. Today is New Year's Day. It's not every year that New Year's Day happens on a Sunday. I'm grateful that you're here. Uh, it's also Christmas tide. If you know the song, we're still in the 12 days of Christmas. And today we celebrate Epiphany. So it's like this basket of all these special days. And I want to thank our Magi who sang for us and with us this day. But we just had, hopefully, you had a quiet and, and good week. It's, it's that sandwich week between Christmas and New Year when we're off school and maybe off work, maybe things are quiet. That week is usually when my wife and I and my family try and catch up with everything that normal people do before Christmas. Like, we haven't opened one single Christmas card. If you gave me a Christmas card, I will thank you in a few days. Um, we didn't send out Christmas cards because we're doing all of these things prior to Christmas, and so we, we spend those days after catching up. We open the cards. We, we watch the movies. We do all the things. And, and this year, I want to tell you, one of my great joys was that finally my oldest daughter is old enough to watch one of my favorite Christmas movies, the best Christmas movie of all time, without a doubt, without bias, is... We don't all agree. It's a wonderful life. Now, disclaimer, I attended college in Indiana, Pennsylvania, which is the hometown of a guy named Jimmy Stewart, who was the star of that. And at Christmas time, Indiana, Pennsylvania becomes It's a Wonderful Life land. Jimmy Stewart has a statue and a library and town hall is decorated and, and all the storefronts show the movie. And so I was very heavily indoctrinated, even as a kid in Western Pennsylvania, to love and watch that movie over and over again. And, and as I showed my oldest daughter this movie, you know, I kept saying, oh, this is so great. And I have to say, we watched it in color, which, which I think helped her experience. And halfway in, she looked at me and said, What's this movie even about? <laughs> There's no plot, she said. And then at the very end, she walked out of her bedroom where we watched it, and she said, wow, that really is a great movie. And I thought, success. <laughs> but the cool thing happened a day or so later when I read an article about It's a Wonderful Life. I learned things that nobody taught me. I never knew. That when It's a Wonderful Life came out in 1946, in December, just two years, or actually one year after the end of World War II, It's a Wonderful Life was Jimmy Stewart's post-war debut. He was in um, the, the armed forces, he was in Europe, he was in World War II, and it was his first movie after the war. The director, Fra Frank Capra, poured a lot of himself. He was an award-winning and well-known producer in Hollywood, and they put this Christmas movie out, and they wanted to rush it in 1946 because they wanted it to, to be available and eligible for awards in 1946. And what they didn't realize was that it was a very crowded uh, season and they didn't get anything. Not only did that movie not win any awards, it actually lost half a million dollars. It was, it, it was $525,000 short of its break-even point. It flopped at the box office and people saw Frank Capra from that point on as a failed director no longer capable of producing successful Hollywood movies, and it was seen as kind of a black mark in Jimmy Stewart's career. Did you know that? How many of you knew that? So for 28 years, nobody cared about It's a Wonderful Life. There was a, a copyright law that you have to renew intellectual property every 28 years, and you only can license it for 28 years. So every 28 years, you have to reapply, and It's a Wonderful Life did so poorly at the box office and was such a, a, a disappointment that nobody reapplied for the copyright. So in 1974, what happened? It became public domain. So nobody owned the rights to It's a Wonderful Life in 1974. So in Christmas in 1975 and 1976, do you know what happened? ABC, when they had to fill time slots, what did they do? They didn't go to Miracle on 31st Street because that cost money. They went 
It's a wonderful life. It was free. NBC, what did they do when they had to fill time slots at Christmas time? It's a wonderful life. It was free. What did CBS do? It's a wonderful life. It was, so it went, into pub, it went into public domain because it was a flop and a failure. And then when it went into public domain, as you were growing up and in your teen years and your adult years and my childhood years and my teen years, the thing was on all the time. All the time. Kind of like a Christmas story. And you know what happened in 1976? America said, wow, that's a really great movie. And it started to take traction 28 years after it was dismissed as a failure. Well, today, It's a Wonderful Life is considered, I think, by the American Film Society or whatever it is, to be the number one top inspirational movie in the United States. It is in the top 20 of all best films of all time, and it's in the top five best Christmas films. Jimmy Stewart, of course, has now won many awards and considered one of the greatest actors of the 20th century. But all of that happened almost 30 years after something was deemed a failure. Now, one of the cool things is that even though everyone deemed that movie kind of a failure and, and a flop for, for almost three decades, Stewart and Frank Capra, the director, considered it their favorite movie. And Frank Capra would open up a theater for his family every Christmas and show his kids and his grandkids and his great-grandkids it's a wonderful life, even when other people didn't care. Why? Because it's, it's a great story. They poured their heart and soul into it, and whatever happened in the United States in that moment, it wasn't received well, but it today would explode. You know, I love stories like that, because how often do we do something and it doesn't do what we want it to do? right? We, we, we try something or, or we take on an encounter or we do something with a person or we apply for something. We attempt something and it doesn't happen the way that we want. And then what happens to our mood, our well-being, our, our overall outlook in life? What happens, right? It plummets because we feel like a failure. It has failed. What can I do? I'm a failure. I'm not good enough. But how many times does something that was a failure from our judgment, later goes on to make incredible impact in ways we didn't plan or expect. That's the story of the Magi. Think about it. The Magi, they took a really long trip. They were uh, considered by historians to be Zoroastrian astrologers. Now, how many of you have a nativity set at Christmas time? Okay. How many of you, your nativity set has wise men in it? And how many of you has shepherds? Okay, you know that's historically inaccurate, correct? They, they probably never crossed paths. They were in different highways, different times. Uh, Luke really emphasizes the shepherds. Matthew really emphasizes the magi. And so they're two different stories. And scholars also believe that the magi uh, most likely arrived months, if not a year or two years, after Jesus was born. We don't know all the details, but what we do know is that they're not Jews. They're not Hebrews. They don't believe in Yahweh, but they're Zoroastrians that they do believe in a God of the universe, and they believe that the, the universe sends us signs by the way that stars and planets are arranged. And so that when something big is happening in history, they believe that the stars would give them a sign. And so the sign that they saw, they would have been familiar with various prophecies from neighboring nations. Think about if you're in Europe, right? If you're, if you're in Eastern Europe, you really are concerned with what's happening in Ukraine, right? Even if you're in Western Europe, right? Because the, the balance of power is fragile, right? If you're in Poland, you're really concerned with what's happening in Ukraine. If you're in Germany, it's kind of a domino effect because Germany borders Poland, which, right? And so you're, you're concerned about what's happening in your neighbor's yard. And in the same way in the Middle East, they were concerned with their neighbors and the people of Israel were not in control, much like the southern part of Ukraine today. Israel was occupied by another power. And they were occupied by the Romans. And so everyone, it's, it's kind of like what someone in South Africa once told me about American politics. They said, we know what's going on in your country better than you do because when you cough, 
we get a cold. And so for these Zoroastrian magi, they see in the stars that there's going to be a change in the balance of power. And they don't know what that means, but they think that it might mean that the Roman Empire is going to be overthrown. And if the Roman Empire is overthrown in Israel, it could have an effect for the whole region. And so they want to invest in what the universe is doing. The universe is telling them that the balance of power is going to shift and the world is going to change. They don't know what that means. They don't know when it's going to happen. But they believe it's going to happen, so they show up to say, God of the universe, whatever you're going to do, I'm in. And they pay homage. That word appears over and over again. Homage, right? They're, they're offering gifts to commit themselves as honoring what the God or the spirits of the universe is doing. But think about this. Just like It's a Wonderful Life, 28 years, really 30 years before it took off, 30 years after the visit of the Magi, Jesus' ministry begins. What do you think happened to those Magi in those 30 years? I'm sure they didn't survive in that time, right? Their life expectancy, maybe they were 30, 40, 50 when they made the trip. So what does that mean? Did you ever think about the fact that the Magi took that huge trip, they gave away all those cool gifts, and they got nothing for it? Did you ever think about that? They never saw the baby come to power. They never met Jesus. They, ne they never saw a change in the balance of power. They committed that effort and nothing ever happened. It was not a transactional visit. They didn't go to meet a president of a nation to get political favors. They didn't go to negotiate something. They went because it was the right thing to do because they sensed that the God of the universe was that we know is our God was doing something and they wanted to be a part of what God was doing. Now, I think about how often in our lives do we focus on outcomes, sometimes on the expense of the way we do things. Now, what I mean by that is you know, when I have a plan in mind and then the outcome, it doesn't actually happen the way that I want, right? I can start to become anxious. I can start to be irritable. But usually what happens is I shift my behavior to try and change the outcome to get what it is that I wanted. How many of you suffer from the disease of hyper-focusing on the outcome of things? Yes? Now, what usually happens, what's the result of focusing on the outcome of things? Tell me. I can't hear you, but I'm going to tell you what I think it is. Anxiety, right? Fear, frustration, depression, and here's my favorite one. Conflict, right? Usually, when the outcome doesn't happen that I want it, it's because someone else messed it up, right? It's because someone else didn't do what I wanted them to do. And so usually then what do I do? If I, if I want this thing to happen and I think about it and I plan about it and I prepare for it and it doesn't happen, I alter my behavior with that person to either cut them out or to let them know that they didn't fit my plan and they jeopardized my outcome. So often we as human beings, when we focus on the outcome, you know all that stuff we just confess to God in that covenant? Usually, the stuff we have to confess to God happens when we are focusing on outcomes. When we are trying to get what we want when we want it. That's usually when we say hurtful things to people. That's usually when we leave them out or cut them out or cut them off. But what Jesus says over and over in the gospel, this Christ child who will become our Lord, what he says more than anything is not Commit to the outcome. He talks us about the way. The way. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not do unto others whatever it takes to get what you want. Right? Do unto others whatever it takes to get the outcome. Jesus, if you read the teachings in the Gospel of Matthew, he kind of doesn't care about the outcome. All he cares about 
is how. How do you deal with the sick? How do you deal with the homeless? How do you deal with your enemy? How do you deal with your, your brother whom you have hurt? How do you deal with people in power? How do you deal with sinners? How do you deal with people? And usually when we see that, we say, yeah, well, what, what about, right? Well, wait a minute, Jesus. I'm supposed to love my enemy or, you know, the person who hates me. Well, what about, what if they're toxic? What if, what if, what if? And Jesus says, yeah, I don't care, really. He doesn't say that. I, I'm inferring that. When we recommit to the covenant of a loving God, this is what I believe it's all about. It is about letting go of the outcome. Now think about 2022. How many predictions would you have gotten wrong in January of 2022? What would happen? What wouldn't happen? Who would die? Who wouldn't die? What would make it? What relationships would fall apart? What businesses would fail? What unexpected things have happened? How many of you would have um, failed a prediction quiz if you were to predict everything that would happen in 22? Raise your hand. Okay. okay. So what do you think is going to happen at the end of 2023? You know how in the news they always publish the list of everyone? Uh, it just always turns my stomach. Everyone we lost in a year, you know. And so when I go into a new year, I think, who's going to be on that list in December 2023, right? What else is going to be on that list? What else are we going to lose? What other things are we going to try and they're not going to happen the way that, that we, we want in this coming year? But renewing our covenant doesn't have to do about, about loss or trying to predict failure. What it is, it's about committing to the way. It's about committing to, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to succeed. I don't know what's going to fail. But this is what I do know. As, as John Wesley wrote in this liturgy and as is present in 12-step uh, recovery documents, this similar phrase that says, God is all or God is nothing. And so if I commit to God, who is all, I'm going to be okay. But if I commit to me and my outcomes and my will, chances are I'm going to be anxious, I'm going to be frustrated, I'm going to be depressed, I'm going to be irritable, and I'm going to have damaged, broken, and frayed relationships. Isn't that human nature? So our recommitting on this day, and I actually have been really looking forward to this day, because... I want to let go of my need for things to happen the way that I want them to happen. And I want to invite you into the same space because if, as people called Methodists, we're part of this great legacy. If you looked at those words, we say, yeah, God, let me have everything or let me have nothing. And it's not that I want to be poor or that I, that, or that I feel that I, I would be okay. The understanding is if God is everything, my nothing is still something amazing. Right? And if God is everything, my emptiness is still full in God. And wherever I fall, God will keep my feet from stumbling and God will hold me. And whatever my failures, like it's a wonderful life, whatever things flop from my expectation, I have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Whatever thing does not go the way you want, you have no idea the unexpected blessing. I remember, I, I want to tell you a story I've told you before. Several years ago, I was in the community of Tizé in France, and I met with one of the brothers there, a monastic brother, and, and I was facing, it was, it was far before I moved to Haddonfield, and I was facing all these kind of career decisions and, and life crises, and I had sat in a worship service, and I had literally drawn a flow chart. If this happens, then this happens. If this happens, then I do this. If I make this decision, and I, and I presented to a monk in France, I showed him my flow chart. I said, I don't know which one of these to do, because if, if this happens, and he, and he just took a breath. He was like, the human always works out in the mind the worst scenario possible. He said, we almost never anticipate the unexpected blessings, right? How many of you going into a situation, you work out all the worst possible scenarios? Right? 
Raise your hand. Okay, we're confessing today. That's okay. Today, I want to invite you into a space and say, I don't care. Because I know that in the worst possible scenarios, the unexpected blessings outweigh anything that I face. And by committing and aligning myself with God, I have aligned myself with the greatest force in the universe. And that force is love. And that love can drive out the fear, can drive out the pain, can drive out the hatred, can drive out the division. And so today, what I want to invite you to do is to let go of your need to control the outcomes and commit yourself, your heart. God, whatever happens in this year, I'm with you. And I ask you to be with me. On page 6, sorry, on page 10, is a modern version of the Wesley Covenant Prayer, which is a distillation of the liturgy we read. I wanted to print this because I wanted you to have it as a way to maybe go back this week and this month and remember these words that define the call to follow Jesus. So let's close this time in praying together. Page 10. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Place me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be put to work for you or set aside for you, praised for you, or criticized for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. I freely and fully surrender all things to your glory and service. And now, O wonderful and holy God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, you are mine, and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it also be made in heaven. Amen and amen. I am so grateful for the space of worship today on this January 1st, New Year's Day, because I know, I just counted and checked my calendar, when is it going to be next year, next time, Uh, We will have January 1st held on Sunday. Do you know when? In 11 years. 2024, we will have New Year's Day held on Sunday, and we will gather uh, in this space on New Year's Day. Isn't it something something special? Yeah. And I'm very grateful for the, uh, the, the words and prayers and the message today reminding us of God's faithfulness. God never fails us. To love, God never fails his covenant to keep his promise. And God invites us to to follow his way to love God and love others. And I want to say thank you, thanks to you all who continue your journey with us by sharing your time, your presence, your gift, and your life with us and prayer as well. Because that's our Uh, the joyful obedience to God's calling, our joyful response and willing and full of surrender to God. God, we are here. Use us and open our hands and open our life to God to use us. And so at this moment, I want us to continue to worship through our giving. And I want to just lift up the various ways to give. The first one is online give. Head on field, emc.org slash give or you know, if you, you don't need to sign up or sign in to give one time. You can give as a guest if you click the button. And if you want to receive the online giving link, please text the word give to the number 856-499-5566. And the number is available on page 12. Or you can just scan QR code with your smartphone to use online giving. And another way is we are going to invite our ushers to pass the plate in this uh, space. And so please give your heart with your gift. I know your small or big gift comes from your big heart. So let us continue our worship with our generous and joyful giving with a gift of music. Thank you. 
we have the great privilege to begin the year with the Lord's Supper, the Sacrament of Communion. And so I invite you to turn to page 20 in your hymnal. We're going to uh, sing musical responses on, starting on page 21, but we'll start the liturgy at the bottom of page 20. Now, communion liturgy is called the Great Thanksgiving. And so I just want to know real quickly, what are you thankful for? Start 2023 with a few words of gratitude. Just tell me. Let's pray. God, thank you for all of these blessings. Thank you for loving us and giving us unexpected gifts along the way when we face difficulty, trial, challenge. And as we go into this new year, God, we hold your hand, our covenant friend. But here, God, in this moment, the prayers of our heart, the quiet confessions of the things that separate us from you and from one another, we come to you and we confess our sins. The shortcomings, the words said in haste, the things that we have done or not done that have harmed others or that have neglected to step up to the opportunities you have created for us to be a blessing. Oh God, in this moment of silence, hear our confession. The good news is that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and this proves God's eternal love for us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. I invite you to say that phrase aloud. In, In the, the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are, are forgiven. forgiven. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name, join, and, and join their unending hymn. are you and blessed is your son Jesus Christ by the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the spirit on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us he took bread he gave thanks to you and broke the bread he gave it to his disciples and said eat Take, this is my body which is given for you, and do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. on each of us gathered here and pour out your spirit on these gifts of bread and wine make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. We celebrate communion today through pre-sealed uh, communion elements for your safety. And uh, if you do not have communion elements, if you did not get them, please raise your hand. We have ushers. We have uh, just a couple in the center aisle. As, as we wait for the communion elements, just a word that the elements are gluten-free bread and grape juice to, to make it as possible, as much as possible for all to take and participate. Yeah, just raise your, keep your hand raised if you need communion elements. There are a few more on the left side and right side, please. I invite you to remove the seal of the bread and know that there is only one loaf, one body, and we are a part of it. While we may feel small, we're a part of many. Take and receive and be the body of Christ. I invite you to turn over the elements and remove the lead for the juice. Let's take it all together. And this is the blood of Christ, love pouring out for you and me. Loving God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you give yourself up to us. Pour your love and grace into us so that we may pour it into others and, be, and show signs of your love and compassion and justice in this world. Make us one with you as we go forth. Amen. I invite you to stand and, and sing our closing hymn, number 581. Let's stand as you're able.
I want to offer a saying to you that I heard recently. Take care of the small things like they are big things, and God will handle the big things like they are small things. It's usually the small interactions that we don't focus on where we cause damage, where we neglect and hurt and dismiss and dispense, focusing on the big things. But if you handle the little things like they are big things, God's got your back and will give you what you need. So may we go renewed in our covenant and our commitment. May God's love, grace, and peace cover you and guide us into a new year. Amen.